It is absolutely a pleasure to be with you today from one of the most special homesteads in America. I am at the homestead at Hardison Mill with the one and only Rory Feek, who you know from Joey and Rory and their music and everything that he stands for. He has got one of the most beautiful homesteads in all of America. And I'm here to get to talk to him for just a few minutes about it and the homestead festival that he hosted here a little bit earlier this year. So don't go away. Rory, thank you so much for being with me today. It's absolutely a pleasure to get to talk to you for a minute. It's nice to have you here today. <laughs> Thanks for coming. You have got one of the most beautiful homesteads I have ever been on, and there aren't too many even left in America right now. I want to start because I heard you tell the story about how you came to find this place. And as dreaming a, dreamy as it is right now, I know it didn't start this way. Will you tell us the story of how this little place began? Sure, I, I moved to Nashville in 1995 to be a songwriter. And um, when I had my first success, which was in like late 1998, I knew I was gonna make some royalties. I was a single father at the time and my girls had only grown up in apartments and so I wanted something more for them and for myself. And so I started looking around and I, I always had a dream of, you know, when you move to Nashville, you imagine living on um, Hillsborough Road where all the stars live and these big, huge sort of mansion-y old colonial houses and stuff. And so that was kind of the idea is like someday, 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 I would love to do that. So I just, pulled out of Music Row and went past the Bluebird Cafe and just kept driving. And that's that's where I found this house, right on that road, same as them, only 42 miles farther <laughs> south. And I saw a homemade for sale sign that a farmer who had lived here since 1936, they put up. And I stopped and uh, and I ended up uh, meeting them and they they uh, took me around and showed me the place. And, and uh, I didn't have any credit at the time and I was looking for a place with a lot of character and this had a lot of character. And so they financed me and we wow. were able to move in. That was, that was the uh, Memorial Day weekend of 1999. And so we bought this old farmhouse and for the first couple years, all I did is work on the inside of the house. And I think I, I literally only mowed maybe 20 or 30 feet outside of the house because I was just so overwhelmed. And, yeah. Imagine everything grown up as far as you could see. You really couldn't see anything. So that's one of the reasons that I think this place is so special is because I know where where it came from. I know mm -hmm. where where it was when I came here and none of this was a vision that I had. It's, it's more like a friend of mine uses the phrase progressive revelation. <laughs> and there, there absolutely was a master plan. It just wasn't mine. Yeah. And over the years, it, it has just all evolved into a much larger story and much larger vision. And I'm really honored and proud to be here and see all that God has done and uh, to be part of what he's still continuing to do. Yeah. I remember you saying it started very ramshackle and small, yeah, it required an immense amount of blood, sweat and tears. And money and money, mm -hmm. yeah, to get it to where it is. And now it is, it's a masterpiece. It's absolutely beautiful. And I know that at least from what I've heard you say before, Joey was really the one that had the homesteading bug in her from yeah. childhood and all through life. And it was you who kind of caught on to it later. Is that right? Or were you raised on a no, homestead? No, 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 I was Joey was raised on a farm. My wife, Joey, uh, grew up in Indiana, raised on a farm and so, she she just grew up in a garden with her mother and and so when she and I got married which is about 2 years two and a half years after I bought the farm we got married and the first thing that she did was start plowing a garden mm -hmm. and that's still where the garden is today that's beautiful and um, you know over the years she would grow a garden and I would help her I would help her at certain times in the garden whether it's tilling or planting but it was really her passion. And then we had chickens and then 
Over time, she would want to harvest the chickens, and so she would drag me along with mm -hmm. her because she needed help. Um, we, she followed Joel Salatin, which is um, you know a real big leader in the homesteading movement Amazing, and sustainable yeah. agriculture. And so we would watch videos in the kitchen of him, and and then she would want me to build something, a chicken tractor that he uses, and so I would build them and haul them all around the garden and. And then when it came time to harvest chickens, we would, we would watch and learn and read. And so it really was her passion, but I knew, I knew well enough to know that even though it made no sense on paper, it made some kind of other uncommon sense that she was aware of. It was definitely cheaper, faster, easier just to go to the grocery store, fill our refrigerator and our freezer full of food but it wasn't better, and she inherently knew that you could not uh, put a normal price tag on these things. And she knew that if, if she waited out, it wasn't even close. It was like growing our own food, our own vegetables, or making fried chicken at home, that from, from chicken that we yeah. raised was a whole different thing, or, yeah. or that we were uh, having breakfast and all of that was from where, you know, from something that we had done meant a lot to her, and it meant a lot to me, but I didn't know how much it meant until Joey had passed away. And I kind of kept doing it. I kept doing a garden because she did a garden. Mm -hmm. I kept chickens and all those things because she kept them. And I knew that they were good, but I didn't know why. And I, I hadn't, pers I haven't, I hadn't uh, like personally experienced it yet, but over time, over the next few years, I, you know, I caught the same bug that she caught, and though my thumb isn't as green as hers, you know, I have a pretty green heart, and so I've sort of learned that this is my place, but mine, mine is maybe a little bit different where she was great in the garden. Um, I'm good in the garden, but I'm, you know, I'm a sort of more of a planter of seeds and people and yeah. in dreams and all those kinds of things, and so it's been wonderful. I hear you. And, and even though this was her dream initially, maybe, you've, you've come along and made it your own. For sure. What has become your favorite part of homesteading that you maybe didn't expect to, to enjoy as much as you do? I think, the f I think my favorite part of homesteading has been the opportunity to basically become and reimagine a family. Mm. So I have, you know, I have siblings and we all lived kind of near each other, not too far. And we've been trying to figure out how to be a family for a long time. But through some of the homesteading things that we've been doing, um, it's given us an opportunity to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And so we're all kind of like playing certain roles in it. My sister Marcy, she really doesn't have to do too much, although she comes out and helps with the garden. She knows her role is the preservation. Mm. So when, when we have lots of fruit coming from the garden, that's something that she's going to be doing. Yeah. My nephew Dalton, his whole role is to concentrate on the cows and the chickens and the pigs and integrate those into the school that we have here at the farm. And so it just feels like it has brought our family closer together physically mm -hmm. and also just spiritually. Like we're, we're all um, gathering together for something bigger than us. And it's been really fun because a lot of those younger generations are learning things that, you know, I, I didn't know until I was in my 40s or later. So it, it's really special. But I think it my is. favorite part is sharing it with my family and friends. Mm -hmm. Is there one thing that's exciting that's going on currently at this moment on the, on the farm that you're caught up in? Well, we have a lot of babies. That's so we fun. had a couple of baby <laughs> goats. Recently, we just had a, a little calf born. Aww. Our horse right there is pregnant. So Aww. in, um, I mean, it's still gonna be like nine months or something, but we'll have a little foal running around. That's beautiful. So there's a lot of life here. Yeah. We also have Indiana, our little girl is eight years old. Uh, she has one more day of school and then it's summertime here. Oh, and then wow. she's gonna go from being a second grader to a third grader 
and in the coming year, we're going to pick up some kindergartners. So we have a dozen children and a full-time teacher, but this will be the first time that Indiana will be an older mentor to other children at school. That's a big deal. So all of those things, like the, the larger picture of life is really exciting to me, that, that I get to move into somewhat of a, of a patriarchal role within our family and my sisters are becoming more matriarchal. Like mm -hmm. they, they're, they're um, molding and shaping the, you know, not just their children, but also the nieces and nephews and all of that stuff. Absolutely. And then we've got a bunch of, my niece just had a baby and we've got kids. I've, there's a little baby <laughs> swimming pool over here. So it's, it's probably my favorite thing is just the multi-generational life that is happening. Yeah, I hear you. You mentioned Indy and that leads me to my next question I wanted to ask you. How do you think that this lifestyle of, of, of raising her on a homestead is going to prepare her for the future and what she'll have to know for the future? Well, I think a few things. One is she's learning some things that most people don't know. You know, her mother is buried in a cemetery just 200 yards from her. her so she understands death in a way that a lot of uh, children never really grow up understanding. But she also understands life. She's, she sees animals being born. She sees some of the animals die. She sees the full circle of life that's happening. She sees that we're planting and that we're reaping and that we're harvesting and that we're sowing. And she sort of sees all, all of the um, all of the seasons, not just of the garden and the farm, but the seasons of life. And I think that's one of the things that's going to be really special for her is that she, she will have an understanding that most of us, we just sort of wake up wherever we live, we go to school, we learn mm -hmm. all the things that they're telling us to learn. We, you know, we go as far as we can in school and whether we go to college or whatever it is, but we really don't understand why we're learning or why we've learned what we're learning. And I think she's got a better opportunity to understand how it all works together. Yeah, I agree. And that's invaluable. Mm -hmm. It's. I think it's, it is. I'll, I'll. Plus, you know, she's, she's unique in that she has Down syndrome and she's in an environment that uh, she doesn't have any idea that she does, nor would she even care because she's in an environment that that isn't, you know, that isn't any different than you have brown hair and I have blondish silver hair she would just she doesn't she doesn't see anything different so I think that's part of it here too is that she sees the world differently than a lot of people mostly because we see the world differently than other people mm -hmm. do we, we have a lot we could learn from her if we would let her be the example that we learn from and how we look at each other in the world. I think so. I mean, I, she is the example and she, she teaches me that stuff all the time. So yeah. she's making a big den out there, not just in my <laughs> life, but I think in, in lives, you know, just seeing her grow and be filled with joy Yeah. and also be so smart and so thoughtful as she's growing. Um, I think she's, she's uh, making a dent she doesn't know she, she is, is, but she is. She always is going to. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, if I can get just a little bit personal with you. Sure. And that is, I've heard you say before that, well, I know that you are a storyteller. You're a master storyteller in music and poetry and even the way that you um, let other people tell their stories. You are able to, to make it beautiful and bring it around so that we all can learn from that. But I've also heard you say that you are on this journey of learning how to live a good story, yeah. not just tell a good story. But what is the story that you want to live out with your life? Well, I mean, it's, it's the story I am living out with my life. It's not a story that I want to live out. It's like I am living You're it out. You're being intentional. I'm being very intentional. And my wife and I did that together. So, you know, I spent a long time as a songwriter focused on learning how the craft of writing a great story, of telling a great story. And once I learned how to do that, uh, even though it became, it was successful and I think I became pretty good at it, it left me a little bit empty. I didn't want to just tell a story, a great story that somebody else is 
um, some imaginary character is living. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of a great story. So that meant for me that I had to start looking at my life like a song. Like, you know, you have to put yourself in a position for God to do what God does, which is quite often that means you got to go out on a limb and do things that are scary. It means you have to wake up and where the safest or the simplest thing to do is just keep doing what you did yesterday and you just have to yeah. wake up and go, you know yeah. what, I'm going to go that way. <laughs> or mm -hmm. I'm going to, and sometimes go that way just means I'm going to do something that doesn't serve me. I'm going to do something that I, I know only helps somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I know it'll lead to a great place because it always, always does. And so we started doing that early on and seeing the fruit of it. And once that happens, you just get more and more excited about doing it. It's like once you start to become part of a story that's extraordinary, you almost don't know how to not do that anymore. And so for me, I, you know, my goal is just to keep doing it, to keep waking up and um, doing my part, hold the pen. Yeah. And try and, and be part of telling a wonderful story with my life. What that is, I mean, I don't really know what the big picture of the story is other than moment by moment as it's being written, I'm trying to make the best choices that I can make. And where I happen to be right now, yesterday was my 20th wedding anniversary, Joy and mm. I and my. And I've come to realize, like with most people, that phrase doesn't get said that way. It said, yesterday would have been my 20th wedding anniversary. But I don't feel that way. And so part of my living the story that I feel called to live is like, I'm still in this. She doesn't have to be present for our marriage to still be going. She doesn't have to be present for me to continue trying to be a good husband and a good father and work on our marriage and all those kind of things. And to feel like she's she's here, mm -hmm. you know, in the you know in the best of ways. And so the celebration of our 20 years together, it, it was a really really special special day for me. I took a, I drove to the little town Mount Pleasant, about 30 minutes from here, to where we met, and where we got married, and where we had our wedding reception. And I had lunch with a friend of mine there, and. We just sort of walked down memory lane and thought about all that's, that's happened. So beautiful. And um, you know, and so I think part of it for me is is honoring where I've been, mm -hmm. not being in a rush to decide where I'm going. I I I only want to go where God wants me to go. I only want to honor where I've been the best that I can. And so yeah, yeah. so just day by day trying to make the choices that feel like God has put on your heart, whether they're hard choices or they're, um, f they seem like foolish choices. To me, it might not be foolish. It might be just, it's, I'm called to go that way. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, usually great stories emerge. They write themselves. They write themselves, yeah. Yeah, I agree. You're just, you, you know, we, we are part of the storytelling and the choices that we make mm -hmm. all day, every day. That's our part, is we yeah. make choices. What those choices become, we don't know. <laughs> Corey Ten Boom had this beautiful illustration where she would, when she would speak, she would show the back of a tapestry and all of the interwoven and tangled mess that it was and say this is often what we think our story looks like, but we yeah. haven't ever seen the other side of it until God turns it around and that may be only when we finally see him face to face that we get to see the front of it and what he was doing all that time. Right. All that mess down here was something he was making exceptionally beautiful. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is most people think of, you know, that a great story is just a happy story. Mm -hmm. It just means I just, I did good things. Good things have happened to me. That's not a good story. A great story has incredible highs and incredible lows. Yeah. And so you have to be thankful for the difficult things. Uh, just like you can be thankful for the blessings, you have to be thankful for the burdens when hard things come. You know, I'm, I don't like confrontation, but when God sends things your way, 
It's like, no, I mean, I don't know why that happened, but I'm excited to see what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And so just stepping into those things is an important part of it. That's, that's fantastic. I'll just leave you with one last question because I know sure. our time is short, but if you had just one piece of advice that you wanted to give someone, um, I would love for you to talk to our folks about one piece of advice you'd give to somebody that wants to start writing their story differently in life and they, and they haven't. It might have to do with homesteading and yeah. that they've never taken that leap because it just seems too difficult or it may be something entirely different. But what is one piece of advice you would give someone that wants to have a different story? Well, I would say, them? so homesteading to me, you, you know, you could be living in, you know, in town. Homesteading has to do with like this right here. <laughs> homesteading, a, a, you know, a choice, a homestead act today compared to the homestead act a long time ago. Yeah. Homestead act today might be, I, I want to be more present with my family. And so when you go in for an upgrade for your iPhone, you decide an upgrade is actually going to something backwards. that goes backwards because I want to be more present and I don't want the answer to my every thought available at all times. Yeah. That, you know, that's homesteading to me. Homesteading to me could be, um, I also, you know, recently um, sold my really nice car and all I have is, is my old 1954 Oldsmobile. And that's a homesteading choice, at least for me it has been. And all winter it was like, it was miserable. It was so cold <laughs> oh. in the car. Oh. And yesterday while I was driving around, it's so hot. Yes. Not only do you not have power steering or power brakes, but you also don't have any air conditioning. And it was like 100 and, and 150 Way degrees in humidity or something. <laughs> but it's actually how hot it is outside. So there's another part of me that's just like, I want to experience life. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want, like, we spend most of our time, we're just gonna run from the car into the house. Mm -hmm. And we don't even really, you know, we don't want to experience life at all. And, and I really, I, there's a part of me that's like, no, I wanna experience some of life, wherever that is. And um, so that was, that choice is more about, I wanna be, I wanna be part of my community. I wanna be home. Mm -hmm. I want home to matter and so, um, you know, that may not seem like a homesteading choice because it's not planting seeds or getting baby chicks, but it actually is because it just means I don't want to be able to get in the car and go every time I want to. I want to be able to stop and think, oh, do I really need to go to Cool Springs to go do this or that? Mm -hmm. It's like, do I really want to do that? And it stops me long enough so that maybe it helps me simplify my life a little bit. And so my advice to, um, to people who are thinking about whether it's homesteading or living a great story, you know, do something hard. Do something very hard for you. Do you hear that? And everybody has different hard things. It could be, it could be, you know, something more than likely that only you know. Yeah. But don't be afraid to do something hard and also don't think you have to have the answers. Like one of my favorite phrases I say a lot is, don't just stand there, do something stupid. <laughs> and what that actually- I don't actually, have to try to do that. <laughs> what that actually means to me is just, if you feel like you've got this tug in your heart, like, oh, I wish I could, or, or I'd love to do that someday. Like today's a day, mm -hmm. you could do that today. Yes. And, you know, and, and remember, you know, people, especially if you're a parent, your children are paying attention. They know if you're trying to do something very hard that's difficult for you or change something about yourself. They know and the people around you know. And you'll be surprised that it's mostly and usually not near as hard as you think it is. And you'll wake up tomorrow or in a week and you'll be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. and a friend stronger. of mine a friend of mine asked a phrase, I don't know, he read it somewhere. He said, Who would you be if you were someone that you admired? Mm. And I think about that a lot. Like, what would, what choice would you make if you were someone you admired? Yeah. And sometimes it's just very, very small things. But that's what I would say. Make a choice that will move you closer to being someone that you admire. Mm-hmm. I love that. I have a, a, I made a plaque for myself because I needed the reminder every time I go through the hallway in my house to see my sign that I made that says, what would I do today if I were brave? And it reminds me 
take the hard choice. Do, do the tough stuff, just mm -hmm. like you said. What would you do today if you were brave? Oh, a, a whole lot of uncomfortable no, no, things. I'm, I'm asking, like, what would you do today if you were brave? Well, I'm... Like, what's, I'm, what's been on your mind? I am you're... bravely interviewing Rory Feek today. Oh, well, that's easy. That's easy. <laughs> I, I, am, I am bravely um, looking continually for new ways that the Lord can use me to minister to people, to make a bigger difference where I'm at. You don't have to go and be on Broadway with all the, the lights and the, and the big splash to make a difference. But to be brave for me right now is often walking across the yard to the neighbors who don't know anything about anything. They don't, they don't want to touch a chicken or I, I've never seen them once come out and enjoy watching the fireflies at night or hear anything about the hope that I have because of the salvation that I have in Christ Jesus. And brave for me right now is having the nerve to walk across the yard just to the people next door and share a little bit of inspiration and hope with them that they probably desperately need to hear. I just easily block it out. Why? It's, it's easier. It's the, path, it's the path that's easy. As everybody live their own life. Don't, don't mess with anybody else or shake the cart up too much. But you're right. It takes some hard choices and then once you've done it you think why didn't I do that two months ago or two years ago it wasn't that big of a deal mm -hmm. that's but great. I but I do go out and enjoy the fireflies even if nobody else is yeah that's wonderful <laughs> well what you could do is you could just start by um, just when when you get a you have do your chickens lay eggs oh, oh yes so uh, you could just bring eggs to your neighbor and yes. just sort of, sort of start there and say we they laid these. I just want you to have these. Touch this. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to tell them that they're better. You just have to tell them that they're that they're mm -hmm. theirs, mm -hmm. and that you were thinking of them and you wanted them to have them. Wanted to share. And you know they can do all the thinking on their on their own. You don't have to share it. You don't have. All you have to do is sort of just share some of the bounty with them, mm -hmm. some of the goodness. And the next thing you know, they might find themselves out there, sitting next to you in a lawn chair watching the fireflies. I would love that. Rory, it has been an honor and a pleasure. To nice to meet you. Thanks yes. for coming out today. Thank you so much for having us. You guys, if you are not blessed already, I don't know what's wrong with you because it has been a very, very special time getting to sit with Rory and just hear a little bit, just a smidgen of his life and be inspired by his story. Thank you for joining us again today and we're gonna see you next week. Until then, will you go out and find someone to be a blessing to today? Bye-bye. Hey there, before you go, I would love to share with you a quick word of scripture. I just had a wonderful time talking with Rory Feet out here on the, the homestead at Hardison Mill in Columbia, Tennessee. And he shared with me his favorite verse that he and his wife, Joey, shared even at their wedding. It came out of Joshua 24. And it's that last verse 15. It's just the last part of that, but the whole verse says this. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's getting dark out there. Now go out and glow.